cutting through the background, but yours is pretty good. <laughs> I know. I just won't go backwards. Okay. Yeah, you got it. If you find it to be a distraction, I'll take it right off. You want me to? And I'll just come right back. Might no, be. You're, Let's go. you're good. Don't worry about it. Okay. We, we have, we, there's bigger things to worry about than our background. You know right? what? Oh, man. <laughs> How you doing today? You're, you're California? Yeah. All right. I'm on the opposite coast. I'm in Jupiter. Where are you? I'm in Jupiter, Florida. Oh, in Florida, where yeah. nobody lives. <laughs> Not really. What? People. A lot of people don't live there. Where in Jupiter? I mean, it's a pretty mellow place. I went oh, to yeah. Florida State, so. I went I to U. I went to USF. We're like kind of oh, right yeah. South Florida. So, uh, Florida, no. Florida State. I mean, USF wasn't much of a. What were you guys? A, what, what were we rivals in? I'm not clear. Uh, nothing, 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 nothing at the time. <laughs> but I think now we could actually compete against each other, USF and FSU. Yeah, Florida State, it's been a bit of a dry patch. <laughs> I know, way dry. I, have, uh, I actually have Coach Bowden's book over here. It's, uh, oh, yeah. I think it's They Call Me Coach. It's a good, it's a good book. But things have, uh, you know. Did you write it? That I don't know. Does anybody write their own books anymore? Maybe Coach Wooden did. <laughs> he's brilliant he's a genius that guy yeah. he had to write his own books yeah so uh, listen I, I appreciate you coming on I, I put this show together I love interviewing athletes entertainers really what I classify as high performers and learning about their journey and and um, using their journey and stories to inspire others you know I've been fortunate enough to work with athletes so I'm definitely biased that I love my athletes so um, well, you need I follow all right, cool. Well, my first question that I like to kick off, uh, I like that you're a spitfire, but where did you learn your, your competitive spirit? Where did it come from? Because there's a lot of talk about competitive spirit. Can you build it? Can you create it, develop it, or is it within you? That's a good question. I think, you know, everybody's so different. I feel like it's a lot of it's in you. And it's weird. I, I've learned a lot, uh, even actually more after I was done competing, uh, because I you know, I'm around a lot of athletes from different sports, but because yeah. I'm not like in the same environment and I'm not there to compete, I'm paying more attention in different ways. Yeah. And I'm also married to an athlete who's completely different. Yeah. It, you know, he's like, Oh, you know, certain, what is it like? Um, creative men gain satisfaction out of experiencing things. And I can't remember what the other, but certain other types of men gain satisfaction out of beating uh, men, right? So I'm married to somebody who actually is competitive, but it's more about the experience mm. and the pushing of oneself. And for me, I was like, well, what's on the line and what's the point? And so yeah. I don't know. I, I think you're, but I think as far as that like diehard competitiveness, I think you're born with it. And then obviously, I think you can have people if they can really bring out that in the best way. So you find your tools and your language. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, today that's like, you know, obviously personal development. Everybody's looking to develop themselves and come up with, you know, killer routines. It's sort of, it's, it's overkill in many ways. So I always like to, you know, find out from those that have competed at the highest level. You know, what is it? What's the it factor? I, I, I personally believe, and people don't like it when I say this, but I mean, talent is real. I believe it to be very real. Oh, well, there, <laughs> listen, there's genetics, of course. Um, but also maybe if you think about it, it's like we're all built. It's like when I meet people that are more compact, right? Mm. And they're like, I'm compact. And I'm like, I'm in some way, and I'm talking outside of even athletics, but even within athletics, I'm like, there's something about whatever your mission is, whatever your trip is here in this world, that is your avatar that's going to suit you. And so I think it's also connected to, you know, it's, it's maybe just part of the story. Yeah. Um, but, and people don't realize too, the, the huge limitation, let's say you're physically really talented and you've seen this a million times, young athletes that don't learn how to work really hard, they're more talented than everybody, they coast on that. Then they get to a group of athletes where these people have more talent, but they've also learned how to work hard. Those athletes suffer greatly, oftentimes don't make it to that highest level. And so I think people think, oh, that's so fortunate. But unless you really learn to develop your mind and your work ethic, um, sometimes that talent is it's almost like here and there and it was like good for you for like three, four years. And, um, and so I think people don't understand, but don't understand that part of it, but it's certainly 
um, talent and like maybe it's part of their destiny. Yeah. Yeah. I like, I like that because destiny is not oftentimes spoken of uh, or not enough, but um, I've seen plenty of first round draft picks. You know, we'd bring them in, draft them, you know, they'd shoot up to the big leagues and literally in a few years they're done because they didn't have, they had the talent, but they didn't have a lot of the other factors that, that go with it. You know, the mindset is definitely a, a limiting factor for so many. I mean, yeah. but how, you know, you think, you know, how could it not be? I mean, so many kids are not developed at home. And, and then you say, hey, you're a great player. Here's $20 million. Welcome to the show. <laughs> you know, go manage yourself. How do you figure that out? It's, I think it's really an unfair expectation to have of these young athletes, especially if they haven't come from an environment. But even let's say you came from like, you had a great mom and dad and you had great mentors and you got a great education. I don't care. I think if you're 18 or 20 and someone hands you a big fat check, how do you not lose your mind? Mm. And also you could tell them the story over and over of the collateral damage of all the athletes before you for 40 or 50 years. And they're happy to come back and talk to you. But we all think at that time that we're invincible. You know, if you're male, you've got testosterone pulsing through your body and you're going to be like, I'm the guy. Yeah. Um, and that's unfortunately goes back to how we learn. And mm. sometimes we only genuinely learn by going through it. And, um, and, th and that's why it's sort of like the same story over and over and over. Um, and people don't realize, like, unless you really love it, um, professional sports, yes, it is a great gift that people can do that. However, it is very hard. Um, you, the other side of that, and you know this, is you better learn how to recover because half the yeah. time you're playing at 30%, 50%, coming back from an injury, whatever that is. Um, there is a little bit like you're away from your everyday life. So I, I think sometimes I, we only see the sexy, wow, you know, side of it, but people don't realize, um, and it's great, but it's hard. Yeah. I always say, you know, for a, like, you know, just using baseball, cause that's my sport, you know, for a seven o'clock game. I know it's a little boring for some, but no, no I'm <laughs> saying it's so brutal. Their schedule, yeah, then you're playing, and then you're traveling, then you're standing around, then you got to go really quick. It's like the one of the more brutal. It's 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 so much here, but but I was you know going to say like for a seven o'clock game, you're getting to the ballpark at one o'clock, and people don't realize that that's six hours of preparation for a three hour game. You know, some nights in Boston it's four or five hours, but for the most part. That's a lot of preparatory work. And, and yeah, you are prepping your body, prepping your mind, you know, recovering. And it's, um, it's, it's amazing what goes into being a competitive athlete. And, and I appreciate what, you, what you, know, you and Laird are sharing now with folks because you're showing what goes on and how to prepare your body and prepare your mind so you can compete in life and business too. Well, I think, you know, listen, if you're fortunate enough that you get to be in sports, it's like it's a very small window. And it, again, it kicks your ass in a whole other way, meaning you dedicate all this time and energy to this thing that then all of a sudden they're like, okay, that was awesome. Thank you. Bye. And, you're you very, and usually people are still quite young and they, ha they haven't learned new ways to express themselves. And I've said this quite a bit, you know, and Laird says this, Laird's like, I'm not a surfer. I surf. And what happens is our identity gets so jumbled up. They'd be like, oh, you're Joe, you're that basketball player, or you're that baseball player. And you hear that your whole life. And at what point do you find the confidence to not only separate from that identity where you stop using that, but you say, oh no, I'm Joe. And one of the ways that I express myself was through baseball, but I also mm. have relationships um, and you know, maybe other things that I can pursue, pursue excellence in. Yeah. Um, and it's just hard though. How do you parallel path that, right? Like how do you do one thing so intensely and then somehow develop a skill set so that when you get spit out, you have a little bit of momentum. It's very, it's very tricky. It's tough because you're, you're sort of a master of that, of that skill. Yeah. And, and that's like, you know, again, when you talk about sports at the professional level, you know, you're being groomed for that. So it's really even the environment, the people in that environment, both the good people and the bad, you just know that. And then all of a sudden you get kicked out onto, onto the street and you say, okay, what do I do? What are my skills? Who am I? And I, I can relate to what you were saying because, you know, I remember um, early in my career, Roger Clemens had told me, he said, listen, D, pitching is what I do, but it's certainly not who I am. Yeah, And, and, I, and I, I always appreciated that. It's, it's really important. And it's, it, I think it's important for all of us, whether you're a CEO or an athlete 
Um, or like, let's say when people, I've had people say to me after I retired and I, I had an experience, I went to the driving range and I took one of my daughters to hit golf balls. And a man said to me, so what are you doing right now? Are you just being a mom? <laughs> so let's just say that. So let's say you, you've decided that you're going to be, a, you know, like if you're a mom or a father and you're like, okay, I'm going to do this in this concentrated way right now. I think all of a sudden we we lose a sense of who we are. And that's why I think the most important thing people could do all along the way is not only have a diverse group of people around them that talk about different things, but that also um, you're, you're reading, you're learning, you're doing different things so that at least your mind uh, is, is aware that there are many, many worlds outside of this small world that we're living in. Mm. And that um, in, in a way, like the more insignificant we can be, and um, I feel like the greater chance we have of kind of rebounding from, from those environments. And, and it's also using it as a training ground. Like you go, okay, um, Ryan Holiday talks a lot about this. He wrote, Ego is the Enemy. If you figured out baseball, let's say, what you can do is say, okay, I know that I have the ability to figure something out. So I'm gonna move into this new area. I don't know what I'm doing, but I have the confidence that I can ask questions, I can show up on time and I can learn something new, mm. not say, I know I can do that really well. I know everyone's going to love me. Those are the things out of our control, but it's like a little kid climbing a tree when they're six and they can get halfway and then they're seven and they go further. What they're building is that confidence that, oh, I can do something new. Yeah. So it's constantly immersing yourself in, in newer situations and allowing your confidence the chance to build. I, I feel like that's a big thing. You know, today, um, you know, it's just everything seems to be very rushed for people. They expect to just do something and be good at it or great at it. And if they're not within a very short period of time, they're out. And they do so many different things, but they never get good at anything. Yeah. Well, and also everyone, we do it and everyone has an opinion now. We used to do that quietly and privately. So it was just part mm -hmm. of it. Um, I think the other thing is everyone thinks they can hack their way through everything and there's just no way sometimes the, the repetition and hours and seeing all the scenarios that we see in these environments, whether, you know, it's a fly ball or a ground ball, it's like you need to see 10,000 of those or 1,000 of those to understand for yourself the nuance that goes into anything, being mm. good at anything. And so... Um, it is an interesting time and you know, the joke about everybody gets trophies for participating and all of that. There's something to be said for kind of getting tired of getting your ass kicked and being like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna show up today and I'm not gonna get yeah. my ass kicked. So instead of like, oh, good job, nice try. Um, you know, so, I, I, I don't, I think we do each other a disservice sometimes by not being like, no, this is hard and not everybody's gonna be good at this. Um, yeah. And that's just kind of how it is. Yeah, you have to you have to experience losing, and you have to experience getting your butt kicked, and I, I I agree with it. It it brings sort of that warrior out in you, and I I, I always it's say I don't right. see enough warriors walking around. Well, that's it. You 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 make a choice at that moment. Yeah. Because what they always say it isn't in fact that you're successful. It's about actually how you navigate being a failure. And that do you get back up and do you, t do you bring those lessons forward into the experience? And I think that that's just important in life. Like think about relationships, think about a, a, a marriage or whatever. It's like, Oh, this is too hard. You know, it's like, yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay. And I'm not saying that certain situations, of course, like they have yeah. their season, but I'm saying overall, sometimes it's like, I think we think, oh, I'm supposed to be happy. I'm supposed to win. Um, everything's supposed to be great. And I think what we really should look at, like look at sports. I mean, hell, baseball is the best. If I hit it three times out of 10, I'm like a superhero, right? Yeah. So that means you're getting your ass a lot more often than you are being successful. Seven times you're getting your ass kicked and three you're succeeding. Right. So that is life. Life is the blend of like, Oh, I had laughter and tears. Mm. I wish I had stress. I had failures. I had successes. Um, I think it's like the more we could actually do that as a framework for people and be like, no, this is the picture, not, oh, it's about winning and being happy. It's like, no, it's about all of it. Yeah. All of it leads to the winning and being happy, I would say, right? Yeah. And that isn't, the, the thing is, is like we misconstrue that as like that's the end all and what it is is it's about the end all is the whole entire experience hmm. 
I like that. Yeah, that's that's super cool because I, you know, there's a lot of parents out there today that they 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 protect their kids from failing, but at the same time, they're they're also the reason why their kids fail. Yeah, and I I'll be honest with you, I don't even push my kids in sports because I know like if it's not your thing, your personal thing, your real personal thing, um, what's the point anyway? Mm. So I back off that all the way, but I think. Um, and I understand wanting to protect your kids, but I understand that it's really impossible. Yeah, yeah, they and, have to And better to learn it at home, right? Like better to go out a little bit in your neighborhood and kind of get your head slapped a little and then be at home by your parents and your siblings who can give you love. Better than we protect you your whole life, then we send you off when you're 18 and then the world comes through like a freight train. Yeah. Because the world isn't gonna care about you the way your family's gonna care about you. Yeah. Exactly. And I guess you can create that micro environment at home where it's, it's a mix of tough love and a lot of love. And, you know, like you said, a little slap on the back of the head as needed, yeah. but, but you're, you're preparing your kids are in training at that point. Yeah. Because I, I believe that we live a little bit in a time where people think, well, if I complain loud enough, somehow certain things will be really different. And that is true about certain things, but there's just no getting around the challenges of just being a human being and yeah. then trying to figure out like jobs, relationships, um, you know, yourself, your sense of confidence, then move through life, then aging, then all these other things. So I think sometimes the sooner we can give them the tools to say, um, I have to, you know, approach this from a thinking person's point of view, right? Mm -hmm. It isn't just about crying. It's about going, okay, what about this don't I like? What part am I in charge of? What can I be, what can I change myself? Because I think mm. that's the, one of the most important lessons is, oh, this isn't the way I want it. Okay, what's the strategy to change that versus right. I'm going to sit here and cry. Well, that doesn't mm. change anything. Yeah. And some um, people would say, well, Gabby, you know, you're being very tough right now. You're being very mean, you know, I? by saying that, you no, know, again, cu culturally, no, I, I, listen, I love it. <laughs> no, but that's just information. I'm not saying, hey, your your shirt's funny and so is your face. I'm saying, <laughs> like, this is, like, if I was really going to be somebody's friend, I'd say it's always about a strategy. It's always about looking and saying, hey, that's out of my control. I'm going to release that. Yeah. This yeah. is in my control, and there's things about it. I would like it to be better, so I need... I. I have to put in play a practice to make that happen. And I, I believe that's the only way anything happens. And also if you and I are toe to toe and we don't agree, how do I develop the skills to understand and respect your point of view, but also to communicate my point of view instead of, well, I'll yell and you yell. Right. You know, and, and you learn that even having teammates, you have teammates you, you actually don't really like and they don't like you, yeah. but you go, hey, we've got a common goal. Yep, so we got to compete together. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. It's it's so interesting. I see a lot of what goes on in the world today. And, you know, just being in a professional sports clubhouse, it's such an eclectic mix of people, nationalities, personalities. I say, man, you know, we always used to, we'd have some conflict, but it would be literally settled at dinner, before dinner, and we'd all be out together having a great time. So it's, um, there's a lot that could be learned from, like, I just feel like we never took anything so personal. And as a result, everything remains somewhat topical and we just kept moving forward towards a common goal. And I think that's men too. Men do that just a little easier than women. I just know from coming from, you know, women's athletics. Yeah. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a different mechanism. Laird always says it's because guys used to have to hunt together and say like, I don't like you, you don't like me, but we have to get this yeah. and I can't actually do it without you. So everything else aside. And I think sometimes like in the world, okay, maybe the way we're going to get there is different. But ultimately, I believe that humans all want the same thing. So how do we respectfully kind of, you know, work around each other and try to accommodate that and make space for, you know, for, for everybody? Yeah, no, I love that. I, one of the things I wanted to talk to you about today, because I find I'd love to hear your perspective on it. But talking about there's a lot of talk today about women and, and empowering women and bringing out the best in women. And then, you know, I just would love to hear it through a, a, an athletic woman's perspective, who's a mom, who's a business owner, um, you know, married, you know, you, you're, you're doing it all. And you hear so often that women can't do it all. I can't have a career and I can't have kids. Can't have a career, can't be married. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, go. <laughs> listen, you can't have it all at the same time. 
Like, um, okay, so I have my foot on my gas on my athletic career and parts of my business before I have my children. Then I even noticed I took a little bit of my foot off the gas when I entered into a relationship that felt important to me that I wanted to put energy into and pursue, right? Like you only have so much energy and right. so many you know, minutes. And then when my kids were really, really little, I even took my foot a little more off the gas in my work and career. And because this was my time with them, but now they're bigger. My youngest is 12. I have three daughters. My oldest is grown up and I have a 17 year old. And now I'm putting a lot more energy into um, my, my work life because my girls are, you know, they can barely want to even be around their parents. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I want to say that they don't arm women enough with is this. And I have, I feel that I'm a very practical I, my approach is usually practical, but also I would like to say that I'm a product of Title IX. I went to school on a scholarship. Um, the businesses I have been in in my 20s were professional sports in a sport where we were paid as much and even for a season, I believe, more than the men because our TV ratings were higher. And then I also was in modeling, which you're paid 10 times as much. So let, let me be clear that I haven't experienced... Um, you know, sort of the downside, but I never thought I could have it all. I never thought it would all be perfect. But this is what I feel is so important for girls going out or young women going out into the world. Men are your advocates. Are there a couple bad people? Sure. What you bring to the table isn't that you have to act like a guy. It's that actually that you're a woman. That is your power, your point of view, all these other skills that women, certain things happen easier. So I think it's so important to go into the world not thinking the world is against you. Yeah, That's for right. me is super, super important. The other thing is, is having the discussion of biological responsibility. If you and I at this, let's say you and I are a couple, we have a baby. The baby is three months old. If you came to you and I and your boss came to you and said, hey, we got a deal for you. It's huge. You're going to be on the road more, whatever, whatever. You'd be like, awesome. I'll take it. <laughs> if they came to me, my boss came to me and said that to me at that time, most likely for me personally, I would be like, oh, this feels more important to be at home with my small child. Now there are plenty of women and there's absolutely nothing wrong. They're like, Hey, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to kick ass and take names. And I don't know about family and all that. And that's totally cool. But what they don't teach us or help us to navigate is if we choose to have a family, um, how do we navigate those two worlds? Cause they're very contrary. And also, um, it's knowing that a lot of times for me personally, it seems silly. Like, I don't care. Like my family's more important. Like if you said, Hey, be the boss and get, you know, piles, of, I'd be like, okay, but this experience is more important to me. So I just, I think women have a lot of opportunities if they choose, as long as, again, this goes back to strategy. What are the landmines? What do you have to deal? Pick a partner that can help you and be realistic. Don't be like, well, I want to be the head of Facebook and, <laughs> you know, have a one-year-old. It's pretty hard. Yeah. It also sounds like too, you're very, um, well, it just goes back to, you know, who you are, you know, what you want. You're convicted in yourself. You believe in yourself. And I always feel like those are the root that that's, that's the foundation of it all, right? You have to have a foundation and values and character, and then it allows you to make decisions that are right for you and, and those around you. Yeah, and I think that's a really important part, which is the way that's right for me, I would never claim to be right for another woman. It, it's just about getting them to, to know who they are, what they think they want to pursue and how they want to do it, and not mm -hmm. apologize for that and just go for that. Because by the way, there's a thousand ways. Like you have kids, you don't have kids, you're a boss, you're not a boss, whatever. It's yeah. all right. Yeah. Um, but I love, I, I love that. How you said that, that, that it's all right. Because I meet a lot of folks too that is this right? Is this the right way? Or is this the wrong way? And it's like, well, what's your way? Think about baseball. How many guys are very good at hitting a ball, but their stances are all just a little bit different suited to their body types, the way they grew up, yeah. whatever. And I think it's giving people that confidence and then for them to get again, go back and, but also listen, you said, oh, I'm confident every day I question. And so I don't want to hide from questioning. I just look at it and go, Ooh, this, I don't, this is uncomfortable. I'm not sure, but this feels like the way to go or, or the way to do it. And you adapt or adjust if you find that you're wrong. Um, so within confidence is always being unsure. Yeah. It's again, it's that balance, right? 
there's, there's that yin and yang to everything. What, you know, in your day-to-day conversation and dialogue with yourself or the things that you find out about yourself, what are some of the themes and, and even some of the, the fears and hesitations that, that you have personally? Well, you know, for me, I'm, I'm at a place, I'm at an age now where I'm understanding the more, how important it is for me to continue to keep an open mind Mm. because I'm learning that, for example, the way my brain is hardwired from my childhood experience is very different than my children. And you can't be like, oh, these kids today, it's like, no, you have to keep an open mind and, and keep expanding as a person and keep learning. And so it's weird right? Because you sort of think, well, kind of this way that I was doing it really works good. But how do I keep an open mind and also keep moving <clears throat> further and further into um, like a form of like, it's all okay. Yeah. You know, even the really crappy hard stuff, you kind of go, this is part of it. And um, not being impacted as much by people's opinions Um, not having such strong opinions myself about certain things. Like, I feel like it's almost like a backing up that I'm, that I, on my day to day now. And and how do you, I, I I mean, I think about that a lot myself. How do you do that without becoming totally like neutralized, you know, or is that the answer? You know, there's so many different camps with that. Do I become so neutral that I just adapt every situation or is that neutrality somewhat uh, of a negative even? You know, that's a really interesting point that I've taught, I've thought about quite a bit because sometimes like I know some people, for example, that have helped me. We've had some um, different circumstances with one of my daughters and I went to this woman named Byron Katie. She has a program called The Work and she has some stuff that can really get people to heal or move through things, traumas, whatever. But she's almost like not of this earth. Yeah. She's almost like, like to your point, so neutral that you're like, well, are you in it are you in the mess are you in the traffic are you in the whole mix with all the humans it's a good point i think there's something to be said for being able to not walk around reacting to so many things and but you're it doesn't mean you can't be heartfelt dedicated invested yeah it just means that you are quicker at not um putting energy either out output negative from you um, or input. It's almost like we take ourselves less and less serious yeah. and just be like, it, you know what? It's okay. So I think maybe then you actually have more energy in a different way to be really connected, connected to yourself and to the people that you're close to. And if you're near nature, nature, but yeah, it's a little more, it is, it's a great question. Cause it is, it's like a neutrality that you're like, oh, do you even care? Yeah, I it's. I, I call it. I title it emotional neutrality. Yeah. And, and there's a question: Is it good or or is it bad? I mean, there's some there's some people that actually by losing it, they they diffuse, they they bring themselves back to neutral. It's yeah. sort of a, a crazy thing, and I see that actually in a lot of you know competitors, type A, high horsepower people. They have to ah, and then it brings them back down, and then they're good. So. Well- but in those situations, right, like in a sport or in certain things, it's like you have to have a little bit of, I just feel like it's a different kind of focus. So, okay, how about this is a thought. There was a, uh, Anthony DeMello talks a lot about awareness. Mm. So there's focus and concentration, and then there's awareness. Right. And so when we're living in life, not when we're trying to hit a baseball, you want to have awareness, which even means like he talks about like, oh, I'm depressed. That's not it. Like, it's almost like not connecting and being the emotion. It's like, hey, I'm, it, there's like a sadness around and then mm-hmm. finding the ways to move that out. Um, and that you're kind of always aware about how you're feeling, even if you're engaged with other things. So I think what you're talking about is rack focus. You're in a thing, you got a new baby, boom, you're in. Um, but then you're kind of other things in your life and you're dealing with employees and you're doing this, you want to have the wide focus and a balance and an awareness versus like this intense focus yeah you're sort of just like moving the camera you open it up and then you get narrow yeah Uh, yeah it's it's interesting i think a lot of people could relate to this you know both in sports and business you know who who do i who what is the place in which i want to come from with things and what's my what's my starting point you know i i talk a lot about too you know as something there's always going to be things coming towards you 
So acknowledge the thing, diffuse the thing, and get back towards, get back on your path. And if yeah. you just make that a series and that's the way in which you operate, you know, but do we go totally emotionally neutral or, or is there another way? Because that's hard, for, especially for competitors. It is hard, especially when you care, right? Like yeah. when you care about something, you're, so they say fear and love, right? Like those are the two things in life because everything yep. out of fear, okay, you got anger, you got all these things and then you have love. So I think it's to your point, maybe understanding what the reaction's coming from. And if it's coming from fear that we go, hey, you know what, at the end of the day, that's not who I'm trying to be. And doesn't mean love is a pushover. Love mm -hmm. is, is still strong, but it's just, it's different. It's not ego. It's not like uh, reactionary. So, and again, this is all process. This is like just trying to practice this through life. Um, this isn't about getting it right all the time, but it's, again, it's about that awareness. So I think it's more about that because we, you know, the more we cannot be from our fear, probably the end result's going to be better anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's like fear. Negativity is the opposite of positivity, productive way of living, right? If you're going to hit a baseball, um, you're not going to be like, well, if you don't hit it, you're a piece of crap and did it. It's like, Hey, I got this. I'm going to put this thing out of the park. Same, yeah. same act. Well, it's, it, it's like what you were saying before. One question we always ask our players is, are you focused on seven or are you focused on three? Are you focused on the three times you get a hit or the seven times you get out? And that really goes for anything in your life. You know, there's going to be seven times in which you get out. Yeah. And let's hope it's, you know, you still have those three opportunities where, where life is good. Yeah. You know, a friend of mine said, this, this, was, this will make sense for you. Um, he said, because I have, I have a podcast, right? And he was like, I said, oh, this interview felt flat or something. And he goes, yeah, but that's the thing is we have those and we go through the other ones. So we get to have those other ones. Mm. You know, like, so it isn't like, oh, every, you want everything to always be as good as it can be, but you realize you have to keep cycling through. So you get those really magical moments that either changed you or changed someone who listened to the conversation and you realize like, oh, okay. Yeah. That's how it is. And sometimes too, I would guess the moments or the ones that we think are great. I know I do sometimes I do that and that was outstanding. And then there's this one that I thought was sort of flat. And that's the one that everybody connects with. It's kind of, you know, it's, it's bizarre, but that's, that's, we're all different. Yeah. Which I guess right. is what makes it cool. It is. And that's where it makes it. That's why you want to have that ability to make room. Yeah. So as, as you go towards things in your life and whether it's a new business venture or a new opportunity or, or even a new challenge, what, what is your approach towards something new? Like as you're, as you're deciding, Hey, I'm going to go in and do this. Like what, how do you know if something's right for you? And what's the, I know there's a lot of intuition there, but, but how do you know what's right for you? You know, I think sometimes, okay, like I'll take business for an example. This goes back again to knowing who you are. Like if we all really need, should and want to contribute. And that means even in business, which means you could be paid to contribute, but ultimately you're participating, right? Like yeah. you're trying to create value. Yep. And so I think this is, well, who am I? What feels good to me? What feels genuine, right? Mm. I don't want to be doing stuff like, oh, this is popular, but that's not me. Yeah. So I think first it's, it's, it's having that, even if you, you want to stretch into spaces that are uncomfortable, that's okay. If it still feels like, yes, this feels like part of who I am. And then what happens is, is maybe you have something happening and you go, oh, I might pursue this. Um, conversely, I've been offered to do things for money, attention, what have you, that you have to say no to. Mm. And I think this is really important. I think it's important for people to, that the, the hardest and most important time to say no is when you can't afford it. And, and then it really kind of shows up for you in a good way in your life. It's just having the belief in that. But once I know like, oh, I'm in this new pursuit, let's say. So it feels good. It makes sense. I look at it. Uh, the people in it make sense. Um, then it's, it goes back to strategy. What are some of the steps that I know today? Because more steps will reveal themselves. Um, I'll learn as I go. But really being as methodical, combined with intuitive as possible. 
Um, because I feel like if you don't have a plan in place, a system in place, even if it's like people are listening, I'm going to get more flexible. Yeah. Okay. Well, when are you going to stretch and what are those stretches and what's the <laughs> sequence and what time are you going to do it and how long are you going to do it for? Silly, but otherwise it's just up in the air. Yeah. And it's the same with a business. Like what are the first steps? Let me look at it. What's, what do I think I want to be and how, what are some of the steps that I know right now mm. that will move me in that direction? Yeah. No, it's super cool. And I guess with that too, how do, how do you go about managing your time? Because I imagine there's a lot of, of people pulling at it. And, you know, how do you, again, I guess it's sort of the same thing. You would decide just everything's about value and contribution. And I say no a lot. You know, the thing is, is what I've learned is, so there's a time to pay your dues. And there's a time like you're like, hey, this next year is going to kind of suck a little and it's going to, I'm going to have to put extra output. And then maybe you get to a certain place. And this isn't, this isn't from like, uh, oh, I'm more important or it's more this. It's like, oh, no, I'm in this phase of what I'm doing. So I have the luxury to say no, because I'd like to just be at home with my family more or go to bed early or just cause. Yeah. And I think that takes like so much guts. What do you mean? I just feel like it does because, again, I meet a lot of people, you know, both in in sports and business. They just feel a constant pressure and a constant push to be pulling that rope. I got to be moving forward. I got to be moving forward. I can't stop. And and a lot of the you know the executives that I work with, they stop oftentimes when there's a cardiovascular event that happens to them or some sort of physical ailment or burnout, panic attack, anxiety. That's their first notice to stop. So it takes courage to manage your life prior to that. Well, here, here's what I'll say about this, especially in business. And I've seen it a lot, a lot, a lot, is you don't build your real life enough. So mm. what happens is you actually don't have something you want to go to other than your work. You use that as an escape. You use that as a justification because you don't want to deal. So true. Right. And it's either the collateral damage of your relationship or your family, or you just haven't developed it. And I, and I think what's so, so important is that if it's possible, if it happens, if you meet somebody, that you build a real life that has meaning in it, that has nothing to do with your work, because we can all hide in our busyness. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, I believe we'll be more effective, more potent in our business, if we have this balance. And by the way, sometimes it's not as sexy. Like when you come home and you're not the boss and you gotta talk about real things and it's uncomfortable and you got a kid crying in you, guess what? That's important. Yeah. But but you know, to that point of sexiness and business, I, I found again, I don't think business is really there's pieces of the business that are sexy. It's you know, but a lot of it is it's moving parts and it's a lot of shifting, pivoting, managing cash flow. I mean, there's a lot that goes into it that is certainly not sexy. And I, I sometimes talk to a lot of young and aspiring entrepreneurs and they're looking for the glamour of business, because they, but they don't understand the day-to-day that what goes into it. And I think this is, I was going to ask you this, you know, your participation as a, a high-level athlete, how it's helped you in business. And I'm just going to guess and say that the fact that you had to take so many reps over and over and over and over and over and, over and again has helped you in business and probably a lot of other parts of your life. Well, and and also systematizing, right? So not to the point of like, I have friends, you know, like you'll hear like uh, (laughs) Tim Ferriss or other people, like everything gets systematized, right? That's too much. Um, Yeah, I'm just not quite at that that level. But what I mean is like, I'll give you an example. If I look, if I know my day and my week and my month, I, I kind of will look at it from a horizontal point of view. So from the beginning to the end, kind of get a real snapshot of what it looks like. And then I spin it so that it's sort of like the head coming at me with the tail behind that I can't see. And just sort of saying, and this is like sport, what am I dealing with right now? You know, and, and, and figure out ways not to drop the ball, literally, you know, like don't drop the ball, be responsive, be on top of things. Even if it's like, Hey, I can't get you that answer right now. I'll get back to you tomorrow. I think that's really, really important. And people think that money is going to solve it. Hey, like if I'm an entrepreneur and I get tons of cash and I don't think that's the case. I think being creative 
making something. You know, it's interesting. I just went through a process where I watched a bunch of people in banking and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, they're just moving numbers and managing and using formulas. I'm mm. like, what about making something? Yeah. You know, like what about building something? So, you know, again, this goes back to the learning of the only way we learn is by going through it. And they go, everybody said it wasn't going to make me happy. And it's like, here it is 25 years later or whatever. So <laughs> I think being an athlete, you learn that you learn about, um, not taking everything on at once. Like I can't worry about a ball that hasn't happened. I only can worry about this ball right now. And, um, and uh, having or organized thinking and understanding what's most important at which time. Um, and also failing. Yeah. Losing. I've had businesses that have, it hasn't worked. We've lost money. It was not a good idea. Not good enough. Not big enough. Too early. Uh, whatever. But you tried, but you tried. Yes. And, and I think that goes with the, the power of failing, you know, which leads you to, the, to, to ultimately succeeding. You just keep going until you hit something that works. I have a daughter who plays tennis and she came home from a tournament and she's a big girl, strong girl. <coughs> she looks the part. And she was playing a girl that in her mind, she probably should have beat pretty handily. And it just didn't go her way, you know? And she, she was in my kitchen and, my she doesn't like to talk that much about sports with my husband and I and I don't say well when I competed I don't do any of that I just try to listen and um she said you know what it was I was just really embarrassed mm. and I was like do you know how courageous and badass it is to be willing to go out and be embarrassed to say I care enough that if this doesn't happen I'm going to be bummed and then if you lose bad enough that you're willing to do it even if you're embarrassed I'm yeah. like, do you know how badass that is? And it's the same with trying. It's like, I'm going to give it everything I have. This means something to me. I'm going to be super disappointed if it doesn't happen. Okay, let's go. Yeah. You put yourself out there. Yeah. It's like, it's the best because even when it doesn't happen, we know we can survive it. And then it's like, okay, yeah. I can survive that. You know, I always say this, there's a quote, the first thing I, you know, when I started working at Yankee Stadium, the first thing I did was I put a quote on the wall and it said, get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And at that point, it wasn't just a quote, but I realized there'll be no more comfortable days. And when you embrace that, it's pretty cool because you're not looking for comfort anymore. You're just looking to attack each day the best that you can. And I think the richness that you feel when you can live your best close to that as possible, whether it's like, you know, your friendships and your, just the way you do everything. I think people don't realize that is the real meat of the deal. Not, Hey, have you, I've got a lot of zeros in my bank account. Yeah. Therefore it's like, yeah, no, I, I go for it. And, and sometimes I'm right. And sometimes I'm wrong. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I'll still keep going for it. I, yep. you know, I, I think that that is, that's really rich. Yeah, totally. Well, you're competing every day. You, you're going out there and you're, com you're competing, which is really honoring yourself because that's within you. You're a competitor. Yeah. Well, which is fun. And I think it's almost going beyond the competitor and saying, okay, the pursuit of excellence and it does. And the deeper I go into years of living, what you really start to understand is what can I bring? Mm. to my house, to the people who know me, to my community. If these guys are on a bigger platform, you know, what, what can I, what can I bring? What can I contribute? I think as you start to go in that pursuit of excellence, that pursuit of like me doing all that I can do, um, that transcends, okay, winning and losing. Yeah. It's funny you brought that up because the other day I heard a quote, I've heard it years ago and, and I may um, misquote it. But I think John F. Kennedy said it, and, uh, or Ronald Reagan, one of the two. And it's, you know, it's not what my country could do for me, but it's what I could do for my country. Yeah, it's Kennedy. And I, yeah, and I think it's just, it's the same thing. It's showing up. What am I showing up to do as opposed to waiting for, you know, things to sort of happen to me and for me? There's a, there's a philosopher named Adler. He was at the same time as Freud. And he goes through this whole book about these ideas about, uh, it's called The Courage to be Disliked. And really at the end of it, what he summarized was what you realize in the end all is the only thing that really makes us happy is to be of service. Yeah, it's so true. 
and it wasn't, he wasn't some Pollyanna, like, you know, it's like, he goes, listen, <laughs> we can go through the whole thing. And what you really start to know is that's it. Yeah. No, it's amazing. I, I got to ask you this because, you know, these were like, I have like just a couple more quick ones, but your daily routine. I know um, my wife is a big fan, <laughs> always has been. And she said, you know, man, what is, what is her daily routine? But I think a lot of people wonder that about you, you know, again, based on your history, you know, based on what you do now with XPT, um, how much time are you taking per day for yourself, for your mental training, physical training? And you may say, time. I don't have any time. I'm busy. <laughs> okay. I can just tell you right out of the gates. First thing is if I don't get it done in the morning, the physical training, it's never going to happen. Me if it too. doesn't happen, I go one o'clock. It's done. I'm gone. Yeah. I'm done. I'm done in emails. I'm done in phone yeah. calls. I'm gone. So first thing, and that's when I have all the energy. So morning. So I do a pull workout. Um, if I'm, let's say normally, if I can pull it three days a week, hour, hour, half full on, same okay. thing. I do some kind of um, three days a week, um, high intensity workout, 45, 50 minutes. Um, I'm pretty diligent about my eating. So if you say, hey, what buys me the time on either side? Nutrition. I'm not making up for a, a bad diet. Okay. I'm just trying to move my body now, if that yeah. makes sense. No, um, totally. Yeah. And so, and now, and like, even like in the last week, I tried to and I'm over, you know, like I, I started hi like trying to hike and find, like I took my dog, whatever. And it's like, I don't want to hike, you know, like I'm like, okay, this is an hour, but I'm <laughs> learning that, um, you know, when they talk about yin and yang, I'm always like, go and get into it. And sometimes I'm realizing that certain kinds of exercise would be better for me. So yeah. I'd say that overall, that's it. And, and then my days are with, you know, kids and uh, business with Laird Superfood and XPT and then Laird's schedule, his interviews, mine, I'm interviewing people, I'm being interviewed. Um, but again, I say no to so many things that it's all manageable. Yeah. No, that's super cool. And, and again, I, I always say that puts you in a nice offensive position. You're, you're doing the things that you want to do, even with the training, you're training when you want to train and even how you want to train. I mean, we do this again, even with athletes all the time, you know, we, we have a plan, but at the same time, there's days we have to pivot off the plan because the athlete is tired, fatigued, not looking to do that today, just mentality. They're, they're just not there. Switch it up, you know? Yeah. And, and that's where that awareness comes in where we cause, but that also means we always have to be honest with ourselves. Like, yeah. Hey, could I work a little harder? Yeah. Come on. You can. Um, how am I really feeling? And so I think, um, you know, have, and, but the other side of this is having the environment. So yeah. I have a built in person in my house that is going. Yeah. So I look and I go, I'm going to go. And so if I, if anyone's listening, I think the other thing that's super, super important is that you have, and, and I, I, I believe that the people we train with don't have to be our best friends and our best friends don't be, have to be the people we train with. You get have people that you so enjoy talking to that you have intimate conversation with, but you don't train with them. And there may be people that you train with, but you don't really want to hang out with them. Yeah. But it's about <laughs> creating these environments that, uh, that you can be successful. So accountability, okay, I'm going to do it at this time, setting times, meeting people. So I don't care who you are, and this includes me, is I have these systems put in place to help me be successful. Yeah. And it's, it's, it keeps you consistent and that consistency yields the result. It's, uh, you know, again, not sexy, not glamorous, but the, it's, it's day in and day out execution of your strategy and your plan. Yeah. And, a, and keep asking for help. I call people all the time and try to learn stuff and pay attention to new things. Um, just cause I think it's important. Yeah, no, I agree. I got, I have this one question that came in from my, my buddy, Anthony. Um, and he's, and his question is who is your favorite sports hero? And if you don't have a sports hero, I'll ask you just hero in general. That's interesting. My favorite sports hero. I mean, listen, I'll tell you that I was first turned on to a woman, if we're talking about women athletes. When I grew up in the Caribbean, I saw an article or a special on Babe uh, Dietrich Zaharias and... I had never seen a woman that like could kick ass like that. I, I didn't even dawn on me. And then Cheryl Miller came right behind that when she was at USC. And I was like, wait, women express themselves that way. And I, even to this day, I'm not like that. Yeah. Like I, I was in awe of like 
that part of like that's what appeared to be this supreme confidence unapologetic i'm gonna mm-hmm. kick everyone's ass i'm not here to like make friends because as a woman a lot of times like it feels really important to me to try to be a nice person mm. i mean and sometimes that's in contrast with being in sports or being a boss or being in business where you have to kind of be brutal sometimes yeah and so i remember that being like whoa um you know and uh i mean living with i have to be honest living with laird is very interesting it's been 25 years and i've never seen an athlete more dedicated to one single thing in my life never and i see it up close like i see it in a real way where you could be like oh okay there's the bs this is a person who it's non-wavering Mm. And, um, and it isn't about someone's implementing discomfort on him. He's moving right freely towards it himself. Yeah. He's, he's in fact engineering the discomfort and it's all very creative, but it's all very uncomfortable. And because the pursuit is so real and pure to want to ride big waves yeah. that, um, it's, it supersedes like, Oh, well, this is hard. He, it's like, doesn't even, and I, and I just, I guess for me, I've just never seen somebody where the books they read, who they hang out with, their training, their food, going to bed. Like it is, I have never seen anything like it. Yeah. It's almost, um, it's, it's obsessive, but it, but, no. it, but it's, no, it's not. It's not. Cause it isn't rigid. That's what I was going to say. It, obsessive without, but he doesn't sound like a rigid guy. No, like he, it's not like a measuring flowing. Maybe it's like my love for this thing that I am pursuing is so big that I'm willing to do all this stuff over here so freely. It's so like I, love. It's love and like just love for what he does. But that's it. That's the yeah. difference. And um, and I didn't have that with my sport. And I and I we have a lot of organized sport athletes that come, and you usually only see it with the lifestyle sports. So if it's a mountain person or an ocean person, but the, to the degree mm. of the discomfort and the relationship with the discomfort, I'm always like, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so as far as an athlete witnessing an ath- athlete and knowing really the secrets, like when the doors, when, you know, behind closed doors, I can, I can say that um, it's actually more pure than people will ever be able to see. Yeah. That's all. I love hearing that because I, I come across again, there are the, a few athletes that are like that, like, a, yeah. like, you know, a Derek Jeter type is very much like he never carried a lot of stress with him about what he did and Mariano. It's just love for what they do. And, and they're willing to do, like you said, whatever it takes to continue to do that as long as they desire yeah. and that they're allowed to, as long as they're allowed to do it. And that's what I think Laird recognizes. Um, like we, Chris Chelios um, was a good, really good friend of ours. And he, Laird is also very well aware that his destiny is in his own hands, which is in good fortune versus like the day an athlete becomes older than the manager. They're going like, oh, you know what? He's going to be too much or we'll put him out to pasture and they're not allowed to do what they love to do. Yeah. And for him, it's like nobody can tell him. He just mm-hmm. takes the board and he can go wherever he wants. And I think he understands that as a real gift to him. Um, versus like, wait, the only way I can do what I really love to do is in that system. Mm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. That's cool. It's cool stuff. I have a a final question. I call this the becoming a champion show. I always feel like we're all on a journey, you know, to really become a champion. We're all champions within, but we're always trying to get a bit better. What, what does the word champion mean to you, Gabby? You know, I always tell my girls, like, be a champion person. I could really care less if somebody wins at all. Mm. If you're not a champion human being, you know, and what does that mean? That me, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't mean perfect. It just means like you're aware that you're here on this planet with other people. If you have the opportunity to do an act of kindness, do it. Mm. If you have a chance to really work as hard as you absolutely can and you do it, if you make a mistake and you say, sorry, great. So for me, a champion um, is somebody who it, it's the full circle. And it isn't just that um, they've been number one, they're the CEO, it's that they're actually trying their best to kind of work in all the facets. Um, and, 
And that for me has been powerful because I've met a lot of quote champions. Yeah. And you're like, it's awesome. But the deficiency is so hardcore on the <laughs> other side. I'm like, I'll just, you know, I want to watch you out there or on the field or on the yeah. court. And after that, I, I don't. And when you meet the ones that are the champion people, they're magic. Yeah. I love that. It's so, it's so true. I, I, I know the exact parallel you're talking about. Like, you know, I wish I never met this person. I, I really enjoyed watching them but I wish I didn't meet them because they killed it. Well, and it's also at all costs. Like for me to beat you or to be the best at all costs, meaning the cost of my family, the cost of my integrity, the cost of whatever, um, at some point, that's not the point. That, that mi we're missing the point. Because if you really talk about sport and all this, it should just be this aspirational thing where we show people, hey, listen, if you love something and okay, you got enough talent, but you work really hard and you're willing to take your knocks. Why we love sports, yes, it's competitive, but it's seeing these moments of like, almost like perfection, mm. you know, where they, they click into like, and I think in a way, if you said, hey, what's that supposed to be? I think sports should be something that really inspires us to be like, wow, I could probably do something pretty cool. Yeah. I agree. I agree. Well, listen, I, I love your enthusiasm and, and your passion for all this stuff from the, the personal development and the body development to just even the application to business and life. So it's, it's super cool what you guys have doing. And um, I hope to get we're out really, there one of these days. You should. We're, and we're really, really fortunate. Listen, we both recognize that early. Like, th I think that's a really important thing to happen too, is like just to realize you know, kind of all the, like the things that you should be, you can and should be grateful for. And because at the end, if you're just being a psycho in pursuit, <laughs> you're going to run out of that gas, that fuel. But when you really recognize like, wow, I'm given a huge opportunity and I'm not talking about in sports. I'm talking about like, if you get to live with a person that you love, yeah. if you get to be healthy, if you get to do a job that like, it's pretty cool, whatever it is. I think that that fuel takes you so much further and so much longer and to much greater heights of success than like, okay, I'm going to be the best. You know, it's like, okay. Yeah. Another one of those, right? I'm going to be the best. I'm going to make a lot of money and uh, I may be happy. I may be miserable. You may, you know, but now I know what you mean. It's, uh, it's life fuel, really. It just keeps you going every day and it gives you purpose and it gives you reason to 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 go at your day you know yeah that's right which is what it's all about it is it's uh you know i always found that I, i've said this before like a lot of depression could be cured by people just doing you know contributing and doing things that they desire you know for the right reasons yeah I, and i and i i really believe that and i think it gets harder and harder because of devices and things like that and um i i'm hoping that like it, it's such a new weird time that it's like an experiment but that somehow we'll all kind of start to figure this out and that we'll we'll adjust you know yeah. i'm right there with you i i was um i was interviewing somebody a couple of weeks ago uh, um and she was telling me about it. she bought her daughter a phone called a, it, I, I think it's called a gab phone oh, have yeah. you heard about this yeah no. and it's a it has um you know it has a camera it, you could text and you can call and maybe and listen to music and that's like pretty much it yeah because i'm because i'm i'm in the camp where like as much as these things provide value i feel like they for me it's an energy extractor yeah. and, and it's a focus killer so i'm like maybe i'll just get one of these phones and go old school text call and that's it and yeah. keep it simple keep it simple primal living <laughs> well yeah that's it biology and technology you know, yeah. get them together. Totally. Awesome. Well, listen, I know you're busy and uh, I appreciate you hanging with me today. So thank you very much. I always, uh, like I said, love hanging with former athletes who are always athletes at heart. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I appreciate, you know, the message that you're putting out there to people and, and, you know, just reminding people that you don't have to be an athlete. Um, you know, champion is transcends, you know, yeah. Listen, I, I love coaching people. That's my, my real, pa my passion in life is coaching people, whether it's in sports or business. So it's, yeah. uh, this allows me to do it. And, uh, and hearing from people like you to support the messages is, is huge. So thank you. 
Thanks. All right. Gabby, I'll see you. I'll see okay. you when I see you. <laughs> yeah, come, come pull train one time. It's fine. I will. I will. Got to work on my breath. Dude, it's everything. Well, the pool is a whole other organism. Yeah. Because I've watched it, some of the stuff online, but I, I have to dig in. Well, you know, you can't dig in until you get in. I know.